Winston Churchill is quoted as having said, democracy is the worst form of government, except all those other forms that we've tried from time to time. My guests today disagree. They think that democracy, a government of, by, and for the people, is actually pretty good, noble even, and something worth working for. Democracy, ahead on Wide Angle. Welcome to the second of my two-part interview with authors and activists Francis Moore LePay and Adam Eichen. In part one, we explored the path across the last half century to what many would argue is the lowest point in our democracy's history. In this episode, LePay and Eichen illuminate the growing pro-democracy movement in this country via numerous examples, both across the U.S. and in our own Commonwealth, of people and organizations that might yet give us reason to hope and join in. I hope you find the conversation fortifying. So I, I should have pointed out, I'm a little remiss in not saying that really one of the points of your work, I think, is to champion some notion of multipartisanship, yeah? That um, people who are familiar with your work, familiar with the fact that you went to UC Berkeley, say, okay, here is a progressive, radical woman, and I don't know that I necessarily am going to agree with what she has mm -hmm. to say. Um, when in fact, what you're suggesting is that regardless if we're Republican or Democrat, we're libertarian or socialist, we're conservative or progressive, if we can, if we can unify behind the idea of democracy, then we, this is something we should all be aimed at. Yeah? Right. Yeah. So if you would, could you fill in the details a little bit more as we're, as, we're, as we're building this notion of what it is the democracy we're headed towards should look like? What are the hallmarks of a vibrant democracy in your minds? Okay, I'd just like to start with this point of unity because 85% okay. of Americans believe that we need a fundamental redoing, remake of how we fund our elections. Yeah. That, that it's just not working to have private wealth in control. So right. there's tremendous unity. 70% yeah. right. uh, of us um, promote that we would like to have public financing, and that's yeah. incredible. Yeah. Um, most of us think that wealth has way too much influence in mm -hmm. politics. Mm -hmm. There are, And even on particular issues, there's much more common ground than yeah. most people think. Yeah. So that's really what we emphasize. Right. This this constant repetition, oh, we're so divided, we're right. so divided, is just wrong right. on the foundational question of democracy. Yeah. And, and really belief that people coming together and really listening to one another in good faith is, and not in the name calling it mm -hmm. mode, mm -hmm. is what they want. So we just are so encouraged that there's so much common ground in this right. country. And so that's really a key part of right. our book, is how much common ground there is. And if, even if you take the 2016 election, think right. about it. Yeah. People who were voting for Trump, people who were voting for, against Trump, were voting really to say, this isn't working, this right. isn't working. We do want to drain the swamp. We do want to have a voice. Right. So this idea right. that we want to be heard is really universal, we think. Right, right. And, I, and I'll quickly say, just building off of that, you sure. know, the during the 2016 election, many people probably didn't realize that uh, on the same day that Donald Trump was elected president, there were 17 ballot initiatives across the country. They were all pro-democracy ballot initiatives. Mm -hmm. 14 out of the 17 passed. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's yeah, incredible, yeah. including, right. and this is the one I love to point out, yeah. uh, South Dakota, the ballot initiative, passed probably the most sweeping piece of anti-corruption legislation hmm. ever. Mm -hmm. And it passed in South Dakota. And South Dakota uh, has voted for Republicans in 80% of all statewide elections since it became a state. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and so, if, if, you know, deep red South Dakota passes, yeah. real fundamental reform, and then places like Maine and Connecticut Right. I mean, this is this is really, you know, everyone is angry. There's no question sure. about it. Sure. And I, I think that's a remarkable sign of that the, of the potential that this movement that we talk about uh, has. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let, uh, let's shift to what is a uh, very blue state, Massachusetts. Yeah. Um, you speak to Massachusetts a little bit in, in the mm -hmm. book. 
Um, what is going on on Beacon Hill? I gather there are some things around the, under the democracy mm -hmm. umbrella that are being debated on the Hill. So if you would sort of clue us in. I'll start and then sure. pick it up. That one of the most simple uh, and profound reforms is called automatic voter registration. So that when you interact with a DMV, for example, you 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 are registered. You can then decline and. But it's automatic. It saves money for the state. It saves time for busy people. And it actually then leads to a higher voter turnout. Mm -hmm. So this is a common sense reform that began in Oregon, is now in 10 In 10 states, states and D.C. Yeah. And D.C. Mm -hmm. And so that's one thing that we're very excited about. We were proud to be actually right. testifying. Right. Um, at, at, at the State House, yeah, at a joint, uh, joint hearing. Um, yeah, automatic voter registration, it's going, the, going to the State House right now. I think the number of co-sponsors in each in both the House and Senate are, I think there's a majority in, a, in each. So really right now what's, what's important is just getting the pressure to get hearings and get, it, you know, get a vote, an up and down vote. Um, and, and the effect is really, again, just to kind of underscore this is massive. In the first three months that Oregon uh, had the program enacted, mm. um, it, when we, or when it, when it went into effect, the number of registrations, the new registrations tripled. Mm in the first three months. I mean, we're talking massive change. Yeah. And, and just to kind of give it, again, this really gets, I think AVR is one of the best examples of the power of this democracy movement mm -hmm. and how mm -hmm. much a good idea can spread. Mm -hmm. Because once Oregon in, in the spring of 2015 passes it, and then it goes into effect January 1st, 2016, um, nine states and DC follow suit. And now one and four Americans live in a state with automatic voter registration. And we're talking massive progress yeah. in a little over two years because yeah. the idea is simple, it yeah. saves money, and it's yeah. effective. And then when we spread the word about this policy, this gets yeah. back to what I was saying earlier, that we, we yeah. know what works. Yeah. And this, the same goes for things like same-day registration and early voting sure. and pre-registration for 16 and 17-year-olds. These are very clear policies right. that we know work well. And so AVR right now is going to be in the state house. It's really mm -hmm. important that everyone who thinks this is a good idea calls their representative. Um, because this, we have a very good chance of having this passed in, in, by June. Um, and this, Massachusetts can become the 11th or 12th, depending upon potentially if Washington State uh, follows uh, in the next couple months. And another thing very quickly is uh, ranked choice voting. And ranked choice voting is it's a very kind of uh, interesting way to get around the two-party system in the yeah. United States. That basically instead of voting for one candidate, you rank your candidates. And then the person who comes in last, if there's no majority, mm -hmm. their votes get kind of crossed off and then reallocated to who the people put in their second choice. So if you right. want to vote for the Green Party as your number one choice, but also don't want to throw away your vote, right. you know, throw it away, right. you can vote Green one, vote Democrat two, when the Green doesn't come in first place, second place, or whatever, right. and come in last, they get reallocated to second place. So think, you know, 2000 election, Gore and Nader. Exactly. Um, and, and there's a group right now, Voters Choice Massachusetts, that is really trying to build up the groundwork um, to, to potentially get a bill uh, through the State House or via ballot initiative in 2020. So is that is that initiative uh, solely for local and state elections? Is it, does it, would it affect national elections as well? I know some of them affect only certain elections in, in that, that locality. Well, I don't think we have the language for the, the okay. Massachusetts bill yet. Um, okay. But the one in Maine got a little complicated based on if it was for national elections or state elections. Okay. And Maine had a little... Maine, but not for ranked choice, not for automatic voter. This is right. for ranked choice. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, and Maine, actually, I should have said this, that on the same election that Donald Trump won in 2016, one of the ballot initiatives was for ranked choice voting. Yeah. So Maine actually became the very first state to enact uh, ranked choice voting for state and federal elections. Yeah. Uh, and then it got kind of caught up in the courts and there's this big process underway right now the legislature voted to overturn it uh, and the, the citizens yeah, yeah. have a, had about 90 days 
to collect, I think, 60,000 signatures to overturn the overturn yeah. and put it back on the ballot. Yeah. Um, so we'll see what happens. Okay. But again, there's, there's some complications, but uh, there, there is a movement right now in Massachusetts to, to have this go into effect. Great. Uh, and it's very exciting. So both automatic voter registration and uh, ranked choice voting right. are very exciting. And, and this just gets to the uh, kind of the ones that are most visible to us, at least. Right. But you sure. know, there still is, you know, once upon a time, Massachusetts, Massachusetts passed public finance of elections. Yeah. The legislature never funded it. Uh. Uh, but there should be a movement right now uh, to try and push for public financing of elections in Massachusetts. Sure. Because if we're going to be the, the, you know, the forebearers of progressivism in the United States, then yeah. we should definitely have public financing elections. Yeah. Um, interestingly, I, I, you know, I, it, it brings us sort of back certainly to, to money and politics. You interestingly don't feel that um, working on Citizens United is necessarily mm. the first step. Maybe these these other sorts of initiatives mm -hmm. are the way to go. Yeah, we really emphasize in the book that the only way that we could ever get to a situation where it could be possible to pass a constitutional amendment with three quarters of the right. state legislatures yep, yep. Are going on board right. with this is to do exactly the work we're doing now. Exactly, exactly. So, so it's, it's, a, it's a strategic decision there. How, yes. do we, how do we build the Yes, ground there's so much we right. can. And what we can do now can have immediate effect in yeah. people's lives. This yeah. is the beauty of it, that, yeah. that people can feel the changes. Yeah. And, um, you know, we, we were just talking about uh, Connecticut, where right. very immediate change in people's lives was a bill about paid sick leave, mm -hmm. right? Sure. Mandatory paid sick leave. Sure. And the candidate for governor who was a businessman was opposed, opposed. But because they had public financing, the public financing candidate was elected and it passed. So yeah, these right. are the kinds of things we could do now right. that really make life easier for people. Absolutely. And and I wanted to right. add on on the, on the uh, voter suppression, automatic voter registration that uh, often it is the lower income people who, who turn out less to vote. Sure. One reason for that is that they are more strapped for time, right? right? Yeah. Yeah. And so making it, it, it automatic voter registration can sound wonky mm -hmm. or marginal, right. but it's right at the heart right. of what right. enables people who are most hurt by the anti-democracy movement to come forward to express and to express their voice. Yeah, so exactly. That's why it's such a profound reform. Yeah. yeah. Um, you, you devote an entire chapter in the book to North Carolina, <laughs> right? And, and interestingly, North Carolina recently receiving the lowest score of any U.S. state or yeah. any entity in the world, for that matter, for its unfair <laughs> districting, districting <laughs> practices, right? Um, right? Organizations across the state, however, have, have exerted themselves for decades mm -hmm. to try and turn that around. And you look at North Carolina as as both uh, uh, an incubator for ideas as well as the trials that they're going mm -hmm. through. Tell us a little bit about what's going on in North Carolina and what we could learn from mm -hmm. that, if you would. Well, I'll start and then mm -hmm. Adam can pick up here because one of the most inspiring things to us is that it is a model, it's an exemplar mm -hmm. of what we call a movement of movements, mm -hmm. where people came together, what I like to call a canopy of hope, you know, mm -hmm. people from, people on social issues right. like um, every, every matter mm -hmm. and uh, just basic uh, poverty issues mm -hmm. as well as fundamental democracy reforms, things mm -hmm. like, you know, having enough polling places and, and very core issues mm. about redistricting, they all came together in a movement called Moral Mondays. Mm. And they were willing week after week, month after month, to come to Raleigh and to sit in and be arrested. Mm. The first year of this movement, 900 people were arrested over the course. These are regular people who had mm. probably never been involved. Right. Mm -hmm. And they've been so inspiring to us to name this a movement of movements. Mm that whatever your concern is, you can come together and make a difference, and they have. We'd love to hear your feedback. Email us at wideangle at acmi.tv. For information about this episode or to view other Wide Angle episodes, visit us online at acmi.tv slash wideangle. I think that for us, North Carolina is the perfect case study. Right, because you have this convergence of anti-democratic forces yeah. coming in in the 2010 election. Yeah. That North Carolina actually made some stellar leaps. It was towards the bottom of the barrel of all southern states, um, you know, in the 1990s uh, and in the 2000s. It really be it 
became one of the most improved democracies. I mean, there was massive reforms. I mean, yeah. things like same-day registration, yeah. uh, and, and let's go pre-registration, and the list goes on and on. Yeah. Uh, pre-registration pre came a little later, but basically there's a whole kind of conglomeration yeah. of reform. Yeah. And then this, these forces come upon the state, really led by Art Pope, who was also kind of in the Coke network. He's the, the, you know, the Coke brothers of, mm -hmm. of North Carolina, a mm -hmm. very wealthy individual there. Mm -hmm. And he kind of funded think tanks and I spent a lot of money in 2010 and took over the legislature and then eventually won the governor's race in 2012. And when that happened in 2013, they passed this kind of what was dubbed as the mo a monster voting rights law mm -hmm. um, that was basically repealed all of the progress they had made and made it significantly worse. Yeah. But the alternative to that is that while it's also, it's kind of the, the a micro example of what happens in the state when all this outside money and in, even kind of just billionaire money comes in mm -hmm. and ties, ties to undermine democracy. It also shows that the resistance and how you form the resistance to yeah. fight back against it. And so, you know, most people don't realize that Moral Mondays didn't just come out of anywhere, mm -hmm. right? It didn't come out, or it didn't come out of nowhere. That actually, mm -hmm. it really began in 2006 when a bunch of forces came together and started working on how do we bridge together people across issues to fight for a broad-based agenda. Mm -hmm. And so it took years of mobile and really having yeah, yeah. tough relationship building between issues and developing trust. Yeah. That's key. It took a long time to develop trust across organizations. Mm -hmm. But they did. And so that when the assault came, they were in a unique position to start fighting back. Right. And they've seen results. I mean, yeah. they got rid of McCory, who was the governor, who was, you know, uh, uh, kind of endorsed a lot of the anti-voter uh, uh, legislation, kind yeah. of anti-progressive legislation. Yeah. And they're still out in the streets, you know, right yeah. now. Yeah. Uh, you know, Reverend Barber, William Barber, is, uh, who's now leading the Poor People's Campaign, started his whole career in, um, in North Carolina. And so yeah. that, that whole model of things like, you know, groups like Democracy North Carolina is another big player. Yeah. They, they yeah. really built this, this real phalanx of, of, yeah. of support. Yeah, and, and that was copied, is being copied in a number of states, half mm. dozen other states. So, you know, I, I always like to say courage is contagious. Yeah, and right. these people showed a level of courage yeah. and just determination that is so admirable. Yeah. So we, yeah. we, we, we entitled the chapter, Listen Up America. Right. Exactly. North Carolina right. has a story to tell. Exactly. And, they and sure it really do. does. And yeah. It really does. It's I really encourage inspiring. anybody who's interested to yeah. read the chapter because yeah. it, it, it it, it wrote itself, you yeah, know. It really it did. did. It, it couldn't so have been, inspiring. You know. North Carolina wrote it. Well, and and two, just to just to sort of latch on to one one piece there that you spoke of, Adam, you know how Moral Mondays sort of can can reach way back to two thousand six for its genesis. Um, that certainly is another piece of this, right? This isn't an overnight thing. Absolutely. Right? We've we've seen a steady creep over decades of the anti democracy movement, and to regain what was lost takes time mm -hmm. and, and right. commitment. And as you speak to, courage and bravery are, mm. are two characteristics mm -hmm. that are very important today. Yeah. Right, and it's also just very quickly, it's also not just, wasn't just reactive, right? It wasn't just resistance. Mm -hmm. And this is yes. a very this important so thing, important. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, about the, what's dubbed as the resistance right now, yep. is that we can't just be organizing around being anti-something, mm -hmm. anti-Trump, mm -hmm. anti- mm -hmm you know, the anti-democracy movement. That, that's not enough. We have to have a positive vision so that these forces that came together to fight back against this anti-democracy movement in North Carolina didn't abandon the vision for a future. Mm -hmm. That actually the strength of their organizing was in the future that they were fighting for. The kind of the, they were marching towards something and they had a vision that they were exactly. able to show. Yeah. And I think that is so important not only to kind of organizing and inspiring people, but also just to, to sustain oneself. Yeah. It, this work is very draining. Sure. And so well, if you don't course. have a vision, if you lose the vision, then right. you, you get wiped out really right. quickly. And right. that's something that the national resistance movement needs to know. Right. And and out of this, the Small Planet Institute that where Adam and I are, that sure. we, we wanted to share this so much, we were creating something called Field Guide to the Democracy Movement. Right. So there's one hub yep. online where anybody can jump on and see what's happening in their state. And mm -hmm. as of next week, there will be a map, so you can just hover wherever you are and, yep. and see what's happening that you can plug into. Beautiful. You can you can scroll through and, and, and identify the kinds of organizations that you might be connected to. Uh, it's, it's really, uh, and since we're local, mm -hmm. we can always say that we would welcome anybody watching this. Uh, to come in and volunteer with us and help us make this right. work. You predicted my next question, <laughs> Frankie, which is exactly that. No doubt there are viewers who are interested in learning more about the democracy movement and hopefully are, are encouraged to get engaged with it. 
resources, organizations that they should turn to that, that you've you've seen in, in in your years of experience. Well, in in if you're based here in in you know mm -hmm. the b large greater Boston area, sure. I want to just give a shout out to Common Cause Massachusetts. Yes. Mm -hmm. The executive director Pam Wilmot <laughs> is an extraordinary organizer, and they are really the, they're the quarterbacks for the AVR fight. Mm -hmm. um, they are just I mean Pam is a remarkable organizer, yeah. and Common yeah. Cause Massachusetts. If you want to get involved in a professional organization doing good yeah. work, yeah. I give my full endorsement to them. Okay. Okay. And right. if you're interested in ranked choice voting, Voter Choice Massachusetts is another great one. Progressive Massachusetts, there are, there are a whole bunch of really great organizations yep. doing difficult work. And this is, this is sure. difficult work, but I want to quickly say mm -hmm. that in this difficult work, there is joy. Mm -hmm. And there is, you know, we, we talk about mm -hmm. in, in the penultimate chapter of our book, it's, we entitled The Thrill of Democracy. Mm -hmm. And I think this is really key because it's, it's in the fight for democracy that we discover things about ourselves, that we transform. And it was really on this topic where daring democracy, this is where the seeds of daring democracy were planted in the first conversations about this, this issue, this, this kind of transformation between you, know, you right. me and Frankie. Mm -hmm. um, we, were, we kind of tried to put words to when we were walking that 140 miles, we, we, we tried to put words to what we were feeling in that moment. And afterward, like, why do we feel so different? And what is it? Mm -hmm. And we finally identify these three internal shifts that were so powerful. Right. Should I go for it, go for it. start with our three? Okay, one of them is simply this idea that we did what we thought we couldn't do. And whenever in mm -hmm. life, you know, mm -hmm. you step up and do something, I didn't think I could walk 10 miles, much mm -hmm. less right. over 100 miles. Yep. And you, then you think, oh, wow, mm -hmm. I'm stronger than I thought. So there was that, but then there was also, we are so lonely and isolated in this culture. And we found that we were bonding with strangers, right. told, mm -hmm. people we'd never meet, a banker, an ex Mm -hmm. You know, vet, uh, a vet from um, Iraq. You know, people yeah. I would never have a chance to meet. A fifteen-year-old from Virginia. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. Um, different perspectives. And totally different perspectives. <laughs> and so it was just overcoming the sense of isolation by realizing these strangers share this mm -hmm. commitment with you, and we found that life-changing. And then, yep. um, you know. Yeah, and the, and the last one I mean is just you know taking ownership mm -hmm. of our problems. There's there's real power. In, in being the, the, we call it the grown-ups in the room, saying that we have solutions <laughs> we have and that we, you know, it is really we the people that decide our yep. future. Yep. And, and all of these things come together. And I have to say that, you know, with the election of Donald Trump, we've been thinking a lot about this. There really is profound hurt in our nation. Yes. Yeah. A real feeling of, of alienation because of this, this brutal economic system that we currently have and mm -hmm. this, this, this political system that just yeah. does not listen. Yeah. Um, it's it, a, it, we it, call it a blame and shame culture. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that is deadly. Yeah. And it just separates us, sure. whereas this sense of, oh, I do have a voice. Right. And there's so much common ground. We may not agree on everything, but on democracy, right. we agree. So, yeah. And so in, in, in this fight, we're breaking the alienation that, that afflicts our nation. Yeah. And I think that's incredibly important, especially as we're moving forward to create the society we want. Because yeah. we do have to take seriously with the fact that Donald Trump did win the election. Yeah. We have some serious you know, soul searching to do in terms of the hurt people feel. Yeah. Um, and we really do think that when, when we're fighting for democracy, it's not only a unifying force, but it, it, it's, a, it's, 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 a, it's a healing force as well. When you say d Donald Trump won the election, immediately I go to the Electoral College versus the popular that's, that, vote. That's true. So I, I just want to add here that certainly the vote that's another issue. is uh, foundational to democracy. And right. so people get really uncomfortable when they realize that the citizens really, we didn't elect. Right. Right. So there is a workaround, and that's one of the things we're excited uh, to share with you, people you, in you the book. You should re read more about it. You read more about it in the book. The solution yes, to because you don't yeah. have to wait for a constitutional amendment to correct the problem of the mm -hmm. electoral college. There's a way. There's a workaround, and we're about what two, 60 percent of the way about there. About 60 percent of the way to there to get yeah. enough states on this workaround, okay. which we explain, okay. and it's so hopeful to us. Oh, yeah. It's called National Popular Vote. You can check it out online. Okay. All right. And I should say, uh, smallplanet.org, I believe, yes. is your website. Yes, we have. Lots of stuff there. Okay. And uh, there'll be links to our field guide very soon. Right. It's just um, fieldguidetodemocracy.org okay. and smallplanet.org and all the things that Adam and I are writing and uh, where we're speaking and right. local events exactly. that we have here. By the way, um, yes. you know, we have a number of them okay. um, sure. often, you know, that people can come to and sure. talk to us directly. Yeah, absolutely. And the Small Planet office, you said people are welcome to come and volunteer. Volunteer. Just Small over Planet. in Cambridge, yeah, Harvard Square. Yeah, right, so right. Very easy to get to on the T on the red line. All right.
Um, and, and certainly, Daring Democracy is another place for, for people to go. Absolutely. Absolutely. We wrote this for, for anybody to understand and as a guidebook to anybody yeah. who yeah. wants to uh, fight for our democracy. It's all yeah. there. The yeah. solutions that we believe yeah. in are all there. All right. Well, I can't thank you enough. Oh. Um, certainly both for your 140 <laughs> miles together, the book that came out of it, um, your continuing work on behalf of, of democracy and, and really putting a spotlight both on the problems as well as potential solutions. 60% um, of it is solutions. See that? That's what we <laughs> aim for here. You, you're, you, that, that is beautiful. <laughs> you too, I, I am going to give an exceedingly deep bow to you for <laughs> the breadth of, of your work over the past years, yes? Thank you. Adam, you are just at the beginning of your trajectory, so I yes. know you're going to be there. But, um, but a, special, a special thanks to you for Thank continuing you. Uh, to, show us, to show us the way and being a, uh, a, a hope fiend. Hope fiend, <laughs> that, that's, that that's the we word, need. yes. We need that. Yeah? Thank you, Peter. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you for having us. us. Absolutely. Much like Churchill in the framing quote that began this interview, I've been something of a political cynic across my adult life, believing that government generally, and democracy as a form of it, were an unfortunate, if essential, series of compromises that we humans must make in order to live together. But my guests today challenged that perspective and have me feeling almost sentimental about the ennobling potential of democracy. If what we have today is, as many warn, but the glimmer of a democracy, then might we continue on with that as a memento of our past and a beacon of our future, sure in the knowledge that democracy may be our birthright, but it is anything but guaranteed. On behalf of Francis Moore LePay and Adam Eichen, I'm Peter Bermudez. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Wide Angle.